Uh, we're very happy today to have Julia. Uh, I'll try to not get it wrong. Uh, Julia's a professor. Um, I just got the tenure, I believe. At not yet. What? Not yet, I think. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Julia got tenure at the Toyota Technological <laughs> Institute in Chicago. Uh, for. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 TTI is, is on the UFC campus, but the separate academic institution. It's a little complicated. Um, uh, Julia got her PhD at Technion, Technion under Sefi Nayor. Um, and uh, then she did postdocs, uh, might get the order right, or even the names right, MIT, <laughs> Princeton, and IS. Okay. Although she lived in Austin for some of that time. And then she uh, came to TTI. Um, yeah, so she's been there, what, five years? Five years. Five years, five years, yeah. five years ago. And um, uh, this is going to be one of her stock papers. She's in um, uh, a prized single author session. <laughs> Julia blames me for uh, for not winning the best paper over the No, it's not like that. <laughs> but, but it is your fault. Not <laughs> <laughs> like that, but it's my fault, right? But you said it isn't. It is my fault. Uh, anyway, she's going to talk about uh, routing and undirected graphs with uh, constant congestion. I never had this kind of introduction, but thanks. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'll talk about routing problems. Uh, so in general, in the routing problem, you have a graph, and you have uh, demand pairs that we also call sourcing pairs, which are just pairs of vertices that want to talk to each other. S1 wants to talk to T1, S2 wants to talk to T2, and so on. So uh, what we want to do is uh, to route as many of these pairs as possible while minimizing congestion. So what do we mean by <coughs> By routing a pair, uh, to route a pair, we just need to connect this pair with a path. For instance, here, we can decide that we route S1 to T1 on this red path. <coughs> so we can decide to route all pairs, or maybe a subset of pairs, like here, right? S1 to T1 is a red path, S2 to T2 on blue path, S3 to T3 on green path, and so on. And once we decide on the routing, uh, the congestion is just the maximum load on any edge is the maximum number of paths that share the same edge. For instance, here we have these two paths that share the same edge. And this is the largest you can get over all edges. So the condition of the solution is two. So just a few words uh, about notation. Um, so as usual in these problems, the number of graph vertices is denoted by n. The number of the demand pairs, S1, T1, plus K, T, K, that's K. And uh, vertices that participate in the demand pairs, or we call them terminals. So you can think about the number of terminals as being roughly K also. Won't change anything. <coughs> so as uh, we already seen, we can route all three pairs and get congestion too. But what if we are really strict with congestion? We cannot allow any congestion. What do you do then? Then you can, for example, route two pairs and get condition one. So in routing problems, you have these two conflicting objective functions. You want to route as many pairs as possible, but you also want to minimize the condition. And in some applications, you can be stricter on one of them. You really have to you know, uh, fix one of these parameters, and then you try to be more flexible and to optimize the other, or the other way around. Or maybe you're flexible on both of these parameters. Uh, in any case, uh, because we have these two, two parameters, we naturally get two problems that are the classical routing problems. The first one is the edge join path problem, and the other one is condition minimization. So in edge join path problem, you want to route as many pairs as possible, but the paths have to be completely edge joined. So we don't allow any congestion. We are very strict on congestion, and then we try to do what we can, what we can do with the number of pairs routed. The other extreme is condition minimization, where you want to route all pairs, so you're really strict on the number of pairs routed, but then you want to minimize the congestion. 
So let me just briefly, these are really the classical problems, so I will briefly show what we know about them. So for the condition minimization problem, there is this classical randomized rounding algorithm of Raghavan and Thompson, and it gets log n over log log n approximation. Again, we need to route all pairs, so this is just the condition. And this is a very old algorithm, by now it's classics, and we don't know how to improve it. We also don't know if it's the best possible, the best current harness approximation is roughly log log n. So this is a really, this is an open problem and, and a very fascinating one. Um, yeah. If you know anything about it, we can start looking at how to pay instead of n. Oh, uh, yeah. So you can get, you can get poly log k congestion and cost an approximation. So now I switch to the Dijon path problem, which will be uh, like more the center, uh, the focus of this talk. So here we want uh, the condition is strict, no condition. We want to route as many pairs as possible. So when the number of the demand pairs is a constant, then the work of Robertson and Seymour gives a polynomial time algorithm. So they have this really long work on the graph minor theory that is like 25 papers. So if you go all the way to paper number 13 or so, I think, uh, one of the side results that they get is this uh, polynomial, time, uh, polynomial time algorithm for solving this problem. But when k, the number of pairs, is not a constant, then the problem is not be hard. It's even not be hard to say whether or not you can route all pairs with no condition. So um, there is a pretty simple root n approximation algorithm for this problem. And this is the best algorithm that we know for this problem. So as far as approximation factors go, uh, we normally want better approximation factors than root n. But we don't know any better approximation factors. And uh, so is this the best possible? So there is some. Mm -hmm. This uh, root n approximation is one k is not constant, right? Yeah, when k is constant, you can solve it. Yeah. Exactly. So in terms of k? Uh, the, the gap is k. I'm going to show it, the example. The gap is k. Okay, so is it the best possible? So uh, one thing that I want to mention is that it's a very standard way to solve uh, routing problems is first cast it as a flow problem, where instead of connecting every pair with a path, you want to route one flow unit between every pair. So what you get is a maximum commodity uh, maximal multi-commodity flow problem where you want to route as much flow as possible between the demand pairs. And you can think about this as an LP relaxation of this problem because you can solve it using LP. So, so this is a standard way to get approximation algorithms first to get the flow and then you round it. And not only is it a standard way of doing it, is the only way that we know how to do it for these routing problems. Okay, there are some exceptions, but on general graphs, this is how it is done. Now, if we look at this LP relaxation, and there is a very simple example that shows integrality gap of root n. So I'm going to show this to you because it's a really simple and constructive example. Uh, instructive, I mean, example. So we start with the grid, and these are the pairs, S1, S2, T1, S2, T2, and so on. And now, every intersection of this grid, we replace by this gadget. So what this gadget does is, if we want, you have to pass one going vertically and one horizontally through this intersection point of a grid, they have to share an edge. So if you look at the fractional solution, then every pair can send one half flow unit just going up and to the left, like this. So in total, we'll send k over two flow units with no congestion. But if we look for an integral solution, then you can see the maximum that you can get is one. Because even if you try to route two of the pairs, and no matter how they are routed, they have to cross. And this place where they cross, this is where they're going to share an edge and get congestion too. So this is a very simple gap example that has been long for a very long time. They show that the integrality gap of that LP is root n, and it seems to be a fundamental difficulty in solving this problem. We basically don't know how to get around it. Very interestingly, there is this result of Rao and Judith that was kind of surprising, is that in some cases, you can get around this gap and get a good approximation, 
And the cases are when the graph is well connected. Well connected means that the value of the minimum cut on the graph is at least log to the fifth n. So in particular, the degree of every vertex has to be also fully logarithmic here. So if this is the case, then you can get a fully logarithmic approximation for EDP. And on the negative side, the hardness of approximation that we know is roughly root log n. So we are between root n and root log n. And this is another very, very interesting open problem. So I just want to mention that there are some special cases on which the situation is much better. One such special case that we will also use a lot today is expander graphs. So in expander graphs, you can solve EDP well. And uh, there is a large number of results, each of them with slightly different parameters, depending on what kind of expander graphs or so, uh, and such things. So I'll just, uh, I'm just going to cite one result, a freeze, that says that if we have a strong enough expander, constant degree expander, then no matter how we select any collection of sourcing pairs that only involves n over log n vertices, any such collection can be routed on the joint path. This is a very, very strong result. Okay, and there is some work on planar graphs, trees, and so on that I don't want to get into. Just that this problem was studied a lot on these uh, special cases. Okay, so here is the situation on condition minimization. We stay with, stand between log n and roughly log log n. On EDP, we stand between root n and roughly root log n. So one thing that we can ask, okay, we are kind of stuck here. What if we allow just a little bit of congestion? Let's say we allow for two paths to share an edge, no more. Can we get much better than this? And you know, also, if you think about applications, it's not clear that in every application we have to be really strict on one of these parameters. Maybe we need something in between. Maybe we can relax things. So this is where this EDP with condition comes in. So we want to get a factor alpha approximation with condition C, meaning that we route opt over alpha demand pairs with condition at most C. Now what is opt? So traditionally, in EDP with congestion, we define opt to be the optimum number of pairs that can be routed with no congestion. Alternatively, you can also define it as the optimum number of pairs can, that can be routed with congestion C, and the result that I'm going to show will be valid for both of these definitions. We just stick with this because this is how it's usually defined. So, so if you think about, again, these two parameters, the number of pairs routed and the congestion, then EDP and condition immunization, they, stu they study the two extremes. But if you want to study the, what happens in the middle, if you want to study the trade-off between these two parameters, then this seems to be just the right framework to do it. So let me now show what is known about ADP with congestion. So again, if we use the standard randomized rounding algorithm of Rogelin and Thompson, we get congestion log n over log log n and constant approximation. But this is pretty high congestion. What if we want to do below this congestion? So until recently, for a very long time, the only thing that we knew is n to the 1 over c approximation was condition c. For instance, if you want condition 2, this will give you root n approximation, no better than EDP itself. And then there was a recent breakthrough from, I guess, two years ago of Matthew Andrews, who showed a polylog n approximation was condition polylog log n. So this was the first algorithm that broke this log n over log log n congestion of Raghavan and Thompson and got reasonable approximation factor of poly log n. Still, if we want a constant congestion, uh, you'll get only polynomial approximation factor. And just uh, very recently, Kawarabayashi and Kobayashi looked at congestion too, and they improved the root n approximation factor to n to the 3 sevenths. So the result that I'm going to show today is a polylog key approximation with condition 14. So this gives us a constant condition. So this is a paper that is about to appear in stock. And so I was trying to get a constant approximation, constant condition, and the constant that came up was 14. And since then, I worked with uh, Shili, who is a student from Princeton. And we brought the condition down from 14 to condition 2. So uh, what happens is that this result it really builds on the main ideas from this result, and it's very technical in bringing the condition down from 14 to 2. Because I'm not going to get into very technical details in any case today, I'll just stick to this. It's just easier to present. 
Okay, so just uh, going back to this picture, so we have seen here that if you want congestion 1, then the integrality gap is root n. So if we use this framework and we want to get better than root n approximation, you have to incur congestion 2. So the congestion 2 is basically the best you can get if, if you go with, with flows, yes. But then it might be that someone can learn a little different out here, right? That's right, yeah. Um, Okay, and, and just to complete this picture, oh, the names of the people are not, uh, there's a long list of authors here, anyway. Uh, so so for, any, for any C, if you want to get condition C, then there is log to the 1 over C roughly a, a hardness approximation. So basically, if you want to get a, a constant congestion, you have to get uh, only polylogarithmic approximation. You cannot get, uh, be better than that. So in this sense, we are kind of close to optimal, even though the poly, log, the poly in the log is, is, is kind of uh, higher than what's here. Okay, so this is the picture. So now if we just allow a tiny bit of condition, condition 2 as opposed to condition 1, we can get dramatically better poly log k. It doesn't even depend on n. Instead of poly log n, and, and there is this almost matching hardness approximation. <coughs> So um, I'll focus on this result, except as I said, I'll just show a constant congestion. And um, so as uh, somebody here mentioned, we still don't really know what is the truth about EDP. So we know that if you use that LP relaxation, you will not get better than root n, but maybe there are other ways to get a better approximation here. And this is a really interesting open question. But still, uh, these results show that there is some fundamental way in which routing with condition 1 is different from routing with condition 2 and higher. So let me show you how it is different. So let's say that I start with some solution where I route x pairs with some condition C. And I want to get lower condition, but still route pretty many of these pairs. So what these results show is that you can still route x over c poly log k pairs with condition 2. So you can reduce your condition all the way to 2, and you only lose c poly log k fraction of the, you, you, you still route c poly log k fraction of the pairs. But what if we wanted to reduce it all the way to 1? What if 2 wasn't enough for us? Then using exactly the same grid example that I showed before, you can show that you may have to lose a root n factor here even if you start with a routing where congestion is 2. So if you have some routing that's pretty low congestion, you can reduce it all the way to 2, but you cannot reduce it all the way to 1 if, if you don't want to lose that much in the number of pairs routed. Are we supposed to see how to do this? I can, uh, how to do this or the second. this one? No. This, ah. Oh. So, so basically, if you route x pairs with condition c, it's like having a fractional solution where you route 1 over c flow on each path. So you get a fractional solution of value x over c and no congestion. And then, uh, because this result does LP routing, uh, rounding, this, uh, this will give you this. Okay. So this result gives polylocate approximation with condition to, to the LP solution. Okay, so <coughs> now I'm going to switch to showing this uh, algorithm that achieves constant condition and routes polylog uh, and achieves polylog approximation. So uh, one of the ideas that has been around for a long time is that we know how to route well on expanders. There are very good uh, uh, algorithms for routing on expanders. So what we want to do is to somehow turn our problem into a problem of routing on expanders. So it would be good to claim that our graph is an expander, and this is, of course, not necessarily the case. It would be also good to then, like the next best thing, to kind of cut this graph up into pieces, say that each one of these pieces is kind of like expander, and then try to solve them separately. We also don't know how to do that. So what we do instead, we define something that's a little bit weaker than the expansion property, but it's kind of connected, and then we work with this property. So this weaker expansion property is called well-linkedness. It has been used before in a lot of work on routing problems. So what is this well-linkedness? So let's say that we have this graph G, and these red vertices are the terminals. Remember, terminals are the vertices that participate in the sourcing pairs. 
So normally, when we talk about graph expansion, we say that for any partition of the vertices into two subsets, the number of edges going between them should be at least comparable to the number of vertices on the smaller side, right? Something like that. Now, for the well-linkedness, we just ignore our vertices and we just look at the terminals. So we said that the graph is alpha well-linked if for any partition AB of the vertices of the graph into two subsets, the number of edges going across has to be at least comparable to the number of terminals on the smaller side, not all the vertices. So the number of edges going between them is at least alpha times the minimum between the number of terminals on each side. So this is like expansion, except that it's expansion with respect to the terminals. So if you are familiar, this is like looking at uniform sparse cut or non-uniform sparse cut. In, in expanders, you look at uniform and here at non-uniform. It doesn't matter if you're not familiar with it. So this is well-linkedness. And I'm going to define well-linkedness again in a little bit different setting because we use this later again. So let's say that we have some subset S of vertices in this graph G. And we look at the set of edges that stick out of S, these red edges. We even call them out of S. And now we want to ask how well is S well-linked with respect to these red edges. So in this case, you can think about eventually we'll want to <coughs> route some flows across this set S. So in a way, you can think about these red edges as being the terminals. And the graph, you can think about the graph restricted to the set S. And then you can ask how well is this graph uh, well linked with respect to these terminals. So the definition is going to be the same, only the terminals are these red edges. And uh, the graph is the graph produced by S. So again, we say that S is alpha well-linked if for any partition of its vertices, the number of edges going across is at least alpha times the minimum of the number of the red edges sticking out of these two sides. So in general, uh, this well-linkedness parameter alpha today is going to be something like 1 over poly log k. So when I say things are well-linked, uh, this is what I mean. And um, and if the set S is alpha well-linked, then for any set of demands that we define over these red edges, let's say that these demands define some matching, you can, fr you can run this matching inside the set S with Condition. Okay, so now we have this graph G, we have this collection of sourcing pairs, and we define this uh, notion of well linkedness. It would have been convenient if this graph G was well linked for the terminals. Again, this is not necessarily the case, but luckily for, for us, uh, in the previous work of Chikurikan and Shefford, they basically reduced the general case to this case. What they did is they show that for any instance, you can take your graph G, you can cut it up into small sub-instances, such that on the one hand, each sub-instance is willing for the terminals. On the other hand, if you solve each one of these sub-instances separately, and you find this fractional flow, and then you add them all up, then you're pretty close to the global optimal solution. So you take your graph, you cut it up into small instances, each instance is well-linked, but you don't lose too much in the value of the solution. So basically what this says, uh, forget about the statement, it just says that you can assume that you're given a graph G that is well linked for the terminals. If you know how to solve it here, you know how to solve it overall. So now we have this graph G, it is well linked for the terminals. Why is it useful for us? So remember our motivation was that we have very good algorithms for routing and expanders. And well-linkedness, it's kind of like expansion property, only expansion with respect to terminals. So we would like to use these algorithms for routing on expanders and use them here. The problem is that even if you're well-linked for the terminals, you can be really far from being an expander. Because you can imagine a situation where you just have a few terminals and a huge number of non-terminal vert uh, non vertices. So you can easily make your graph well linked for the terminals, but to be far from being a general expander. Still, the intuition is that if you are so well linked, so well connected for the terminals, 
then somewhere inside this graph, there must sit an expander spanning these terminals. So this is what we want to do. We want to find this expander that sits inside this graph G that spans the terminals, and then solve the routing problem on this expander. In other words, what we want to do is to find an expander on a subset, a large subset of these terminals that is embedded inside the graph G. So by embedding the expander, we mean that expander vertices are mapped to the terminals, and expander edges, they become paths inside this graph G, connecting the terminals. And once we find such an embedding, we just want to route a subset of the demand pairs in the expander. And right away, when we find this routing, the embedding of this expander gives us the routing in the graph G. So this uh, high-level uh, idea was, uh, was uh, proposed by Chikuri Khan and Shefford a few years back. They only use a more general term of a crossbar, which is a graph through which you can route efficiently. But here, the crossbar that we use is an expander, so we'll just stick with expanders and we'll forget about the crossbars. So uh, once you find such an embedding, the congestion of the embedding is the maximum load on any edge. So this, this edge is already a path inside graph G. We don't require that they are joint path, but we want our congestion due to this path to be pretty small. So the bottom line here is that uh, we started with this joint path problem. And it turns out that it's enough to just find a good embedding of an expander into your graph, and then you're done. So the whole problem of EDP boils down to being able to find an expander and embed it into your graph. So how do we embed an expander into our graph? There is a really, really neat tool, uh, which is called the cut matching game, that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So for the next slide, just forget about the fact that you are trying to embed an expander into a graph. I'll just show you the game itself, and then we'll see how this game helps us to, to do this. So um, what is this cut matching game? It's a game that's played between two players, the cut player and the matching player. So the cut player wants to build an expander, and the matching player wants to stop the cut player from building the expander. So they start with this graph that only has end vertices, no edges. And then the game is performed in iterations. In the first iteration, the cut player computes some partition of the vertices of the graph into two equal sized uh, subsets. And the matching player returns any matching at once, complete matching over these vertices. The edges of this matching are then added to the graph. Second iteration, the cut player computes a new partition of the vertices. Matching player returns a new matching, again added to the graph, and so on. Until the graph here is an expander. So what Kandekarao and Wazirani have shown is that there is a strategy for the cut player such that no matter what the matching player does, after log square n iterations, th this is going to be an expander. And here n is again the number of vertices in this expander. So the matching player, you can assume it's adversarial, but there is an algorithm for the cut player to compute these cuts in every iteration, so that after log square iterations, we are done. So now, how is it useful to embedding an expander into a graph? So let's say that we have this graph G, and it is well linked for the terminals. And now I want to define an expander over the same terminals, and to embed it into G. So we use the cut player to find the partition of these vertices into two subsets. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find flow between vertices on the left and vertices on the right, like this. And not just flow, I want it to be integral flow. I want them to be paths. Now, if I told you I want to connect this vertex to that one, this one to that one, and this one to that one, then this is like solving a decision path problem. We don't know how to do it. But if I tell you here's a bunch of vertices on the left and a bunch of vertices on the right, I want you to connect everyone on the left to, to somebody on the right, then you can do it. The way you can do it is this, is, is, is you compute the maximum flow problem between the two sides. This is like a single source, single sink flow problem. And then you use integrality of flow. 
because you don't care who connects to who, it's like a single uh, source, single sink flow problem. So once you get this path, you, they define a matching between these vertices, and you treat this matching as the answer of the matching player. Remember that the matching player can be adversarial, so it doesn't matter what we get here, it's good enough for us, we just add it here. So in the second iteration, we get a new partition, again we compute this flow, add it here, and so on. So the cut matching game uh, guarantees that after log square k iterations, we get an expander embedded into G. Uh, sorry, so what, what, what Kerry gives us is after log square k iteration, we get an expander here, but the way we found this expander <coughs> gives us right away the embedding of this expander into our graph. So the well likeness is used to solve the long separate classes? Yes. <coughs> yeah, there is a problem with this solution, right? Yeah. What is the problem? Right. Uh, yeah, so, so this, this, uh, this is a good thing, but the problem is that we get conditional log square k. Because we compute this matching log square k times, right? Every time we can accumulate conditions, so in the end we get condition log square k. And this is a really serious problem because it's kind of inherent in this algorithm. The cut matching game in, in the algorithm for the cut player, the cut that you compute in each iteration, it really depends on what happened in previous iterations. You really have to do them one by one. You can't do all these log square k flows in one shot. So this is a problem. This is why we don't have easy algorithms for EDP. How do we get around this problem? So at a high level, uh, the problem here is that in every iteration, we compute these matchings over and over, over the same set of edges. If we could somehow separate these edges, and in every iteration use a fresh subset of edges, but we still want to be well linked, then maybe we could get around this problem. Okay, so just to be clear, all, all this is previous work. It's just there was a lot of previous work to, to describe. Okay, and this was the idea of Rao and Zhu. So what they did was they took this graph G and they wanted to split it into log square k subgraphs, where every subgraph takes the same set of vertices. Every edge basically selects one of these subgraphs uniformly at random. And they want to make sure that each GI is still the length for the terminals. So you can do that using techniques of Karger um, only if the value of the minimum cut is in G is log square, it is, it's very large, it's, I'm sorry, not very large, fully log. So, so this is the theorem that you can take these edges randomly, each edge will randomly select one of the uh, subgraphs and, and, and still all the cuts are roughly present, uh, preserved. This works in the scenario where the min cut in G is uh, fully logarithmic. If it's not fully logarithmic, then we basically don't know how to do that. And uh, finally, the algorithm of Andrews uh, basically tried to do this and to get around this problem that the mint cut is not fully logarithmic. So uh, it was a neat and uh, a little complicated solution, and in the end, it gave a fully log log n projection. Could you say some words about how they split the G into yeah, 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 so this, they split it very easily. Just uh, every edge randomly selects one of, the one of the graphs it's going to belong to. That's it. Yeah. This is the algorithm of Karger. I think he called it a graph skeletons. Mm -hmm. That you can basically sample the edges of the graph with some probability, and still the cuts will be preserved if the min cut is large enough. <coughs> okay, this is where the new stuff uh, starts. So how do we get a constant congestion? <laughs> uh, so first thing, uh, okay, we start again from the same uh, starting point. We have the same graph G, the same collection of demand pairs. And as before, we assume that the graph is rolling for the terminals. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to define embedding of expander into graph a little bit differently. That will make it a little easier to work with. So let's say that I want to embed an expander over a subset of terminals into G. So first of all, every vertex, instead of embedding it as a vertex, I'll embed it as a connected component in G that contains that terminal. 
So this is this vertex, this is that term, and so on. And these connected components, they don't have to be disjoint as long as every edge belongs to only a constant number of them. So this is one thing. The second thing, how do you embed edges? So an edge between these two terminals is embedded as a path connecting some vertex of this component to some vertex of that component. And again, we want to have a small congestion. So every edge of G may only belong to a constant number of these blue components and only a constant number of these red paths. So this we'll call it a constant congestion embedding. So now, uh, why is this embedding enough? It turns out that if you find routing on vertex disjoint paths in the expander, then this gives you a good routing here. Let me convince you why this is true. So let's say there is an STPR in that expander and I route it on this red path. Now each one of these red edges, it translates into this path through which it is embedded in G here, right? But now you simply use the fact that each one of them is a connected component, right? So you can just patch them up in any way. Just choose the path connecting these two endpoints. So together with this path inside these connected components, it gives me a path connecting S to T. Now if I have a bunch of paths in X that are vertex disjoint, not that disjoint, but vertex disjoint, and I do this kind of translation, then I will use each one of these guys only once because they're vertex disjoint, and each one of these guys is only once. Now, because each edge of G participates in a constant number of these blue components and in a constant number of these red paths, we'll get a routing with constant condition here. So even this kind of embedding is fine. Why do you need these components? Uh, you'll see, just easier. You'll see. Um, OK. So the only thing, OK, we now want vertex disjoint routing instead of edge disjoint routing on the expander. It will not be a big problem because the expanders that we build uh, will use this, again, uh, cut matching game. So all these expanders, the degree is bounded. It's not constant. It's polylogarithmic, but that's still OK. So we can handle such expanders. Okay, so again, as before, uh, the problem of solving EDP boils down to the problem of finding an expander and embedding it into G. Only we change the definition of expansion a little bit to make things easier for us. Okay, so from now on, we'll try to find this expander and embed it into G. So the tool that I'm going to use to do it is called families of good vertex subsets. Uh, let me define it. So let's say I have this graph G, these are my terminals, this is a subset of vertices. I want to tell you when is this subset considered good for me. So this subset is good if two things happen, uh, three things. First of all, it cannot contain any terminals. It has to be well linked for these red <coughs> edges. And the third thing is that it can send a lot of flow to the terminals. A lot is k over polylog k. If I find a set like that, I'm happy it's a good set. Now, what is a good family of sets? It's log square k such good sets. And they have to be disjoint. OK, so we have here log square k sets. Each of them can send k over polylog k flow to the terminals. So if you put all these flows together, you'll get log square k congestion. And they're all vertex joint and well linked for the edges that come in. So now the proof has two parts. The first and more technical part is to show that you can find such a family of good subsets. I will not show it here. The second part uh, is if you have this family of good subsets, then you can embed an expander into your graph. So this I will show you at a high level. Oh, okay, so let's say we have this good family of vertex subsets. So I'm going to show you that from here it's pretty, okay, how easy that it's possible to get an embedding of the expander into your graph. So you start with these vertex subsets. Yeah? It's something I don't understand. If 
the graph itself can take only two minutes, then how would you find this SI? Uh, if the, you mean a star? Yeah. No, so there's no other nodes except the two minutes. So it's already. Uh, okay, uh, so the way you do, so, so first of all, the way I didn't say it, but you do a couple of steps where you make sure that the graph is a constant degree graph by replacing every vertex by a grid. So you do that first. I see. Yeah, the, the, you can only find it if your graph is constant degree, but you can do it without loss of generality. But even in that case, I can have to expand the itself of constant degree. Yeah. Only on the terminal. Then so you can, no, no, constant degree expander on the terminals. Okay. And then this preview, I don't need to find an expander, but. Okay, okay. Okay, so the preprocessing step first, you ensure that every terminal has degree one by adding more terminals if you need. Second step, if you have vertices that have high degree, then you replace them with a the grid. Mm -hmm. From here, you can. Okay, so uh, so we have this log square k um, good subsets, and now what we are going to do, we'll build a bunch of trees. Each one of these trees will contain one terminal and one edge from each one of these guys. So we want a lot of such trees. Here were fully located trees. They don't have to be disjoint, but we want every edge to only participate in a constant number of such trees. <coughs> and again, each such tree, we want it to contain an a terminal, a distinct terminal, and a distinct edge from each one of these sets. So the way we think about this, if we look at say, this orange terminal, we think about this orange edge there as being the copy of this terminal for that set. This orange edge here is the copy of this terminal for this set and so on. So the way we build them is that all these terminals that participate in the trees, in each such set, each set contains a copy of one of each such terminal. Okay, so each such terminal has an edge in each one of them. Okay, so I want to say a few words how we go from here to here. So if we were to take these uh, vertex subsets and contract each one of them into a super node, just a vertex, then the problem of finding such trees is like the problem of packing standard trees. And now if you look at these flows, you can turn these flows into a fractional solution for this packing of standard trees problem. I don't expect you to see that, but intuitively this is, this is what it does. And, and we know how to route this fractional solution to get a tickle solution, this can be done. Now, unfortunately, this is not a single vertex, it's a subset. So in general, it looks more like packing group standard trees, which is a much more difficult problem. But because these subsets are well linked for these edges, we kind of can use them to simulate the super node to a limited extent, but we can still do it. So it's not straightforward, but, but you can do it. And the congestion here is constant. Uh, congestion constant, yeah. So once we get these trees, it's really easy to take an, uh, to build an expander and embed it into the graph. Let me show you how. So first of all, we'll only build an expander over terminals that participate in the trees. There are k over polylog k such terminals, so we are fine. Now, the way we map every vertex of the expander, this was your question, I guess, is every vertex is mapped to the tree that is connected to the terminal. So the blue terminal is mapped to this blue tree, the orange terminal to this orange tree, and so on. So the connected component <coughs> representing every terminal is the tree containing the terminal. Now, to define the edges, we just use the cut matching game, again, of KRV. So the cut player computes the partition of the vertices of the expander into two equal sized subsets. What we do is we go to this first good set, and this partition gives us a partition of these edges, right? Because we have a copy of each terminal here. And now because this set is well linked, we can connect these pairs. We can find some matching just like we did before. And this defines the matching over this, uh, uh, connecting these two subsets. We add it to the graph. 
And the second iteration, we get the second partition. Now we go to the second set. Again, we look at the partition induced on these terminals, on these edges here, find this matching, and so on. So in the end, the number of sets that we have here is log square k, exactly like the number of rounds in the KRV game, in the cut matching game. So after log square k iterations, what we build here is going to be an expander. And here, these this mappings of edges will give us an embedding of this expander into our graph with constant congestion. So there is one subtle point that I didn't mention is uh, each one of these sets is alpha over length or alpha is one over poly log k. And I said, okay, we can route inside of it with constant condition. It's not true, right? You can only uh, route with polylogarithmic condition. <coughs> so the way you get around this is uh, something called grouping technique of Chikuri, Khan, and Shefford. What they show is that given such subset, you can efficiently find a subset of edges, a pretty large subset, but you boost the well-linkedness. The well-linkedness becomes so good that if you only look at these edges that you have selected, then you can route anything there with condition one. So for each such subset, instead of taking all the edges, you can run this grouping technique, select a subset of edges, which is still pretty large. You only lose the polylog of these edges, and but you boost the well-linkedness. So this is how you get the routing inside here with condition, with constant condition. So uh, to summarize this algorithm, uh, the first step is to find a good family of vertex subsets, something that I didn't show you how to do. From there, you build these trees, and using these trees, you embed the expander into G. Then you just use one of the standard algorithms for routing and expanders to find vertex decision routing on that expander and translate this routing into routing in G. So now I want to take a few minutes to talk about some consequences of this result. So let us again look at this graph G, and let us again look at the sourcing pairs. Let's say these are the sourcing pairs. We want to route them. So the algorithm will, will return a routing of some polylocate fraction of the pairs with condition 14. And now, which pairs will it route? We really don't know. We have no control. We just run this algorithm, it returns us, you know, these are the pairs I routed. Well, we would like to tell it, these are the pairs I want to route, and we would like this algorithm to route these pairs. The trouble is that if I tell the algorithm which pairs I want to route, this is like I asked it to solve the EDP problem itself. I can't do it. So we want to meet somewhere in the middle. I want to have a lot of control over which pairs do get routed in the end. But they can't go all the way there, <coughs> because then it will be like solving the EDP problem. So here is what we can do. So let's uh, say that we have this graph G and a set of terminals such that G is alpha well linked. What we can do is efficiently find the partition of the vertices of G into groups where each group is not so big, size is polyloki over alpha. But now I'm free to define the sourcing pairs in any way I want as long as each one of these groups only participates in one pair. So I can define the pairs in any way I want like that, and then you're guaranteed that the algorithm will route them with constant congestion. So this gives me freedom to tell the algorithm which pairs I want to route, but I am constrained in the way that I can only select one guy from every group. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so why is this useful? Okay, so there are some applications that I worked on where it is very useful to know that, you know, you can tell the algorithm which things to route as long as you are with this uh, constraints. What I'm going to show now the next application is from here you can very easily get uh, some kind of uh, uh, flow sparsifier, so I'm going to show that. But this is useful in general for routing problems. Okay, so um, just a few minutes, I'm going to show uh, to say something about flow sparsifiers. So flow sparsifiers, they were introduced by Moitra and then later on Moitra. So here, let's say we have some graph G and we have a set of terminals. <coughs> and let's say that I want to solve some flow problem over these terminals. And I don't even know beforehand which, what kind of flow problems I'm going to want to solve. Maybe I'm going to want to solve many such flow problems every day, a problem, things like that, right? 
So the idea was is what if we can represent this graph G by a much smaller graph H. So the terminals in H are the same as in G. So every terminal in G belongs to H. But the graph H is much smaller. At the same time, we are hoping that H will also preserve all the flows in graph G, maybe approximately. So the reason to do it is first to save time. If we want to solve so, uh, flow problems on a smaller graph, then it will just take less time, especially if we have to solve many, many flow problems on this graph. You just compute the small graph once, and then you save time. One thing. Another thing, we have many algorithms that achieve some polylog n approximations, whatever approximation factor that, not, uh, that depends on n here. So if instead we can solve this problem on the smaller graph, maybe we can get also better approximation. In fact, they do manage to show some really nice black box and uh, ways to get better algorithms there. Okay, so more formally, what does it mean that we want H to preserve all flows? We say that any set of demands that is fractionally routable here can be also routed in H with no congestion. And the other way is if you can route it in H with no congestion, then you can route it in G with some condition Q. So this is a quality Q sparsifier. So, um, so there are these three previous papers that showed that you can build quality uh, locate over low locate sparsifier, sparsifiers, even if the sparsifier is only allowed to have k vertices, just the terminals, nobody else. And then uh, there is a recent work of mine that shows the existence of constant quality sparsifiers of this size where C is the total capacity instant on the terminals. Uh, this is, I want to talk about something a little bit different. So what this framework lets us do is, if you want to solve some flow problem on G, you can solve a donation, go back to G. But what happens if you want to solve some integral routing problem, like the Duchenne path problem, condition minimization problem, and so on? We can try to do the same thing, right? First, you compute the fractional solution, the flow in graph G. Then, given this good sparsifier, you go to H, and the same fractional solution is still good there. So you can get a fractional solution of the same value in graph H. Then you can solve the routing problem in graph H, get integral solution. And after that, what you want to do is to be able to take this integral solution, this, this collection of paths connecting the demand pairs, and take it back to graph G. Now, the problem is that what this framework tells us is that well, given a fractional solution there, you can get a fractional solution here. But given an integral solution there, it doesn't tell us that this integral solution exists here. And even if it exists, it doesn't let us find it. We don't know how to find it. So this motivates the definition of integral sparsifiers that basically try to address this problem. We want to make these flow sparsifiers also work for integral routing problems. So here, what we want to do is any set of demands that can be fractionally routed here, can also be fractionally routed there. We allow some loss of Q1 and the condition there. But this is the same as saying that we lose D or Q, we lose a Q1 factor in the total demand routed. So we don't really accumulate condition by that. We just lose something on the quality of the, on the, on the amount of flow routed. On the other hand, when we take any integral solution in graph H, we want to be able to route the same integral solution in graph G, where our condition goes up only by some small factor Q2. So if you take this routing with grouping, it's very easy from there to, to get this result, that you can get integral sparsifier. The first parameter is how much you lose in the fractional solution going from here to there is fully low K. The second parameter, which is the final congestion that you get, is only the constant factor loss. Now, I'm to correct that we added 14 to 2 now. Um, yeah, so we didn't really compute it, and also uh, it, it is better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's not totally straightforward. Okay. Because the grouping theorem, it will not work with condition 2. It will be a little worse, maybe 3 or 4. Mm -hmm. But this will be a little better, yeah. Okay, and the size of the term of the of the sparsifier is the total degree incident on the terminals. So, so in a way, things will now depend on k and not on n. It's like a black box reduction that does it. 
Okay, so the way you use it, again, you take this graph G, you take optimal fractional solution, and then you look for the optimal fractional solution graph H, and you are guaranteed that you only lose a fully locate fraction in that. Then you compute some alpha approximation in graph H with some congestion C. You turn it into a solution that draws the same pairs with only congestion 31C in, in the original graph. So overall, you accumulate only constant congestion and lose polylocate in the number of pairs routed. Okay, so I'll uh, end up with the uh, open problems. So one of the fascinating open problems here is condition minimization, where we are between <coughs> upper, uh, upper bound roughly log uh, and lower roughly log log n. So we don't know how to tackle this problem, but you can ask some intermediate questions. For instance, what if your graph is well linked? Can you do something then? Or what if instead of routing all pairs, we only want to route a constant fraction of pairs? So this will be like the other side of the spectrum. We were looking at very small condition. Now we want to route almost all pairs. So we still don't know that. Now, EDP problem is a very, very fascinating problem where, so this root n approximation is the best currently known. And there are these really simple family of graphs called wall, uh, brick wall graphs. These are the graphs. And even on these graphs, we don't know how to get better than root n approximation. Basically, the integrality gap of root then will also still hold here. So this is like the simplest graph that we can figure out. And it's, it's strange when you have such concrete examples that you still can't figure out what's going on. And here the terminal is on the border. Uh, well, uh, you can start with terminals on the border, and then maybe you can solve it also for terminals anywhere. This, this is the same as that example with the yeah. I think in graph theory they use this more often than the grid. And uh, yeah, so so when we so so the result for condition 14, the power of the log is like just below 20, but the result that we get for condition two is like log to the 93, I think. Okay, so it would be really nice to get some clean. It will probably also be a cleaner algorithm that gives a better like power of log. And, and then, of course, uh, then you can also ask if we can get better integral sparse affairs. So I'll stop here. Thank you. A really quick question. What's the like tricks that you need to do to get from 14 to what, what parts are can you type? So what happens there is that there are a few steps. First, you find this good family. Then you build the trees. And then you also need to route the terminal pairs to the trees. Each one of these steps, first of all, itself is more than two conditions. But then you add them. They just accumulate. So one of the most difficult things is to do all these three things in one shot so the condition does not accumulate. You just have to be really, really careful, and it's really, really technical. <laughs> <laughs>